question out there um, that relates to something I'm really curious about people to see how, how oddly I differ from everybody else. Um, the question would be, what did you want to be when you grow up? I think assuming we're all grown up at this point in our lives. So just something to, to think about when you were little, what did you imagine? Because I just want to imagine how far away you are from what you were planning on being and you know how close you are. So I'll just start off by saying, I wanted to be a flight attendant. So I'll throw it out to um, Sheila. Um, so I wanted to be a physician and a musician and both have come true. Okay, that's good. Um, awesome. Um, thanks. Thanks for that, Uni. I think for the sake of time, maybe we'll just do um, task force members and if Beatrice joins, that's, that's... then maybe we can <laughs> cover her as well. Um, okay. I but just... yeah, just so we can get through the whole Move agenda. Along. Okay, I think that's 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 cool. You know, um, I was hoping somebody would say they wanted to be a princess because I hear that a lot of the kindergarten graduation ceremonies they all want to be princesses when they grow up. Well, anyway, well, welcome to the the, the subcommittee meeting. This is the smallest of the subcommittees with only um, three members, but we typically have attendance um, with folks from um, different places. Our last meeting was February seventh, about roughly a month ago. We had attendees from Colorado State University, Conservation Colorado, some EJ um, advisory board members, some folks from the CDPHE's Tox Enviro EPI office, and um, someone from the Public Utilities Commission. So I think data is, is really important. And along those lines, I just wanna give a really high level reminder about what our objectives are. The first objective is to, um, draft a plan that addresses the lack of data and data sharing between state agencies and potential exposures to environmental hazards. The second um, objective is to make recommendations about how to improve research and data collection efforts that are related to um, health and environment of um, disproportionately impacted communities. And then the third objective is to develop recommendations um, for establishing measurable goals for eliminating environmental health disparities for disproportionately impacted communities. So why is this um, um, subcommittee important? Um, this data can um, supplement or validate or um, support the, the concerns and experiences of those um, folks that are disproportionately impacted. Um, we've heard from some of them that um, when they attend meetings and they, they talk about their concerns, they're being asked to show data. So hopefully we can fill that gap. And also um, the data would be able to link some of the health outcomes that they're experiencing with um, environmental exposure needs um, in, in, in the community. So some of the things we thought about as we were thinking how to have this discussion is um, we wanted to start with understanding what data is available. So we, we charged um, the folks at CDPHE to kind of do this lay of the land and identify all different sources of data. And so hopefully that would start us to start thinking about um, where the da data gaps are. Um, and then some of the other things we want to start thinking about is how can we address this whole question about cumulative impacts with data and then um, the other issues that came up during our meeting was considering some of the benefits and burdens. How do you start thinking about balancing those two? And um, thinking about also data that's available within um, the Office of Health Equity. And so there are all these different charges that we've asked CDPG to pull together for us. And I am really happy to announce that we will be listening to some of this information that can hopefully get us closer to where we need to do to be with um, understanding um, this data. So our agenda today, and I'm gonna press a magic button and Lovna is gonna share it on the screen. Oh, and I wanna welcome Beatrice too. Um, she just made it here, you know, welcome. 
to our meeting. Thank you. So I've already kind of really flew through the first piece of it, you know, um, welcomed everybody, kind of got, talked about what we did um, at our last meeting, and then we'll get a, some updates from Labna. So this first few minutes of the meeting is dedicated towards updating. And then um, Joel from the EJ unit at CDPHE is gonna talk about EnviroScreen 1.0, which is um, the tool that was developed to um, help shed a little bit of light on, on you know, where these communities are located. And then we'll have a presentation from, from Dr. Davis, who always dreamed to be a physician and there she sits and I'm happy about that. So looking forward to her presentation. And then um, finally, we'll hear um, from Mandy Reese um, talking about data accessibility and, um, and um, data analytical information. So um, that is our agenda. Is that anything else that anybody wanted to add to the agenda that was missed? Okay, so I'm gonna put Beatrice on the spot real quick too. So my icebreaker question today, I hope she's still there, was what did you wanna be when you grow up? I'm assuming that you're grown up now and um, I'm just curious to understand what people's dreams and aspirations were and, and how close they are to them. Do you, do you want me to go, um, yes, Uni? Yes, your turn. <laughs> we, we already went. I think, I think I did. Did I say what I wanted to be? I can't remember. But go ahead. Well, thank you. And I apologize for being late. My Uber took a while to pick me up. Um, I actually wanted to be um, study art and do sculpture. Um, I come from a working class family and it seemed very unattainable to dedicate my life to art. <laughs> so I kind of, I was really good at math and, and physics. So I went the, um, the more practical way and I'm an architect. So I figured I could still be artistic. <laughs> There's very little room to be very artistic in architecture. There's a lot of codes, but um, <laughs> uh, maybe m maybe one day when I'm older and retired, I can go back to those more creative um, origins of, of art. But thank you, Uni, for that's a great question. Yeah, but you know, you still have um, pieces of art out there that, um, well, in the form of buildings and stuff like that. That you know that. There will be a monument to your to your childhood dreams. So, okay. So I'm gonna pass it over to Labna. She has an update for us on um, um, a student project. Yeah, I just wanted to um, share out with this um, subcommittee in particular, since um, at the last meeting there was um, a couple ideas that were thrown out about what would be useful um, to the subcommittee, and one of those was a benefits versus burdens map. Um, and since then, we've been talking with Dr. Katie Dickinson at the Colorado School of Public Health. Um, and we have a group of three students there that are gonna be working on a project to help support our work. Um, one of whom is with us today, Jason. Um, and um, as of right now, their project is gonna focus on two major focus areas. Um, one is conducting a literature review that focuses on environmental justice screening resources that exist in other states. Um, and kind of understanding what methodologies they use, um, you know, what their um, indices and measures are, um, and how disproportionately impacted communities have been um, defined in, in those settings with those other tools. Um, and then secondly, um, the students are going to be focusing on creating a geospatial analysis that maps out communities benefiting from environmental burdens placed on disproportionately impacted communities. Um, and we're kind of thinking of doing a bit of a case study in um, Commerce City in North Denver. Um, and there's been a lot of emphasis on, obviously, you know, the important part is focusing on disproportionately impacted communities. Um, but I think also thinking about who is benefiting um, is something that this group is interested in and that um, there isn't a whole lot of research on. Um, so just wanted to mention those things as a as a quick update from the last meeting as um, those students are starting to already work on that project so thanks for that and um, I will 
uh, turn it back over to you, Yanni. Okay, thank you. I think that's very um, timely and um, usable information. And I'm not sure whether the benefits would also incorporate looking at um, some of the things we talked about, um, like a community's existing capacity to, um, to, to absorb the change in terms of, I think Beatrice and I had talked about um, existing social networks and things like that, that, that you know, they're, they're, more, they're, they're more qualitative than quantitative but those are the, the things that kind of um, we need to have a better understanding of as we start thinking in terms of, you know, it's not so much the benefits, it's just kind of thinking in terms of a, a community's capacity to, to change and to communicate and to engage and things like that. So thank you for that. So I am like right on schedule. I'm really proud of myself. So. I hope Joel, you're ready to go next. I'm really looking forward to learning a little bit more about um, um, Colorado's Enviro Screen tool. Uh, you know, I've looked at the other tools, and I, and and this is saving me the effort of going to test it out. So I really appreciate this. Thank you, Joel. Go ahead. Great. Well, thank you, Yuni, and the other members of the the task force, and. Um, as, as um, Uni mentioned, I'm Joel Miner. I'm the, the manager of the Environmental Justice Program for some of our, our guests in the, the audience who might, might not have met before. Um, I'm part of the team that's working to develop Colorado Enviro Screen, which is our interactive environmental justice mapping tool in Colorado. Um, that team includes other staff from CDPG's Toxicology and Environmental Epidemiology Office, Air Pollution Control Division, um, and but the actual main developers of the tool are, are a group of contractors at Colorado State University, led by Dr. David Rojas Rueda, who is the um, actually a member of our advisory board or our other environmental justice group. So um, we work closely with David and his team at CSU in developing the tool. Um, it is currently not done, so um, there is a, a closed private beta session just for a few folks to test out in, in February, which includes all, all the task force members. So Uni and, and Sheila and Beatriz may have had a, a chance to take a look at that um, with the tool while it was still in beta testing. We got a ton of good feedback during that, that closed wave beta and um, we're working on integrating it into the tool now. And we'll be launching a, a public beta test on April 19th. Um, and there will be kind of an opportunity for everyone to test it out. Um, we have a big public meeting scheduled for April 25th. So we're, we're working on getting the the, the word out, um, Morgan Cameron, our, our Environmental Justice Unit Assistant, who's with us today, has actually been working hard on kind of doing the paperwork to get some Spanish language radio ads and, and some kind of place in Spanish media. So thank you, Morgan, for that work this week. And we're really trying hard to just really spread the word um, so folks know that it's happening. Um, so I, I hope you all will, will join me in, in kind of sharing that information with your channels for, for the late April. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is not really a, a demo of the tool or, or kind of anything specific since you're the, the data committee. Last time, I believe Beatriz asked some questions about what indicators are we including in the tool and what aren't we including and why and kind of what the strengths and limitations are. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and dive in. So we have, we have five categories of indicators. And when I say indicator, I mean data sets that we're building into the tool. Um, we, we group them as environmental exposures, which are things that when you are exposed to them in the environment, we know they have a direct impact on your health um, or, or can. So th those are things like um, air pollution, um, drinking water, for example, things where we know there's sort of a direct nexus to something going into your body. Um, environmental effects. So these are things that exist within the natural environment that if everything is going well, they, they probably won't directly impact your health, but it's still sort of part of the environmental fabric. and also, if there's potential violations of regulations, if for some of them that are things like um, regulated facilities, there, there could be impacts. So there are things that exist in the environment, but there's sort of less of a direct nexus to, to your health. Um, there are climate indicators, which, which relate to sort of vulnerability to different aspects of, of climate change. Um, so think, well, I'll, I'll go into these all in more detail in a moment, so I'll provide examples. And then we also have um, sort of, th those are on the environmental side. And then on, on the human side, there are sensitive populations. So groups we know are more vulnerable to environmental health risks due to some aspect of 
either a medical condition or, or some other aspect of their perhaps age or other medical factors, and then socioeconomic factors, so um, aspects of sort of our society that we know are correlated with sort of greater vulnerability to environmental health risks and sort of health disparities overall. So just keeping in mind these are kind of our five categories, I'm now going to go to what is probably a, a scary slide um, for, for, actually, I'm sure it's not actually, we have, we have a we have lots of really qualified people on the task force and, and data geeks here, but th this is a, a map of our um, scoring method that we use to take all the indicators and in EnviroScreen and come up with a score. So um, an EnviroScreen score, if you think of it as out of 100, it, it's a percentile ranking system. So we have to weight all of the different indicators that, that go into it. So at a high level, the sort of environmental factors we, we call the pollution and climate burden factors, they're half of the score. The other half are population characteristics, so the, the sensitive populations and socioeconomic factors. Within the environmental factors, we further break it down. So environmental exposures, um, uh, which are the things that have sort of direct impacts on our health, they get half of the weight within the environmental side. So 25% um, of the overall weight come from, comes from that environmental exposure. And then for environmental effects and climate vulnerability, since there's less of a necessarily direct nexus to, to an environmental health impact, those, those each get sort of a, a one eighth weighting overall. So they, they collectively equal 25% um, um, going into the overall score. Um, and then within each category, we have lots of different indicators that I'll run through momentarily. Um, and depending on how many indicators there are in the overall sort of weighting for each category, um, they each indicator kind of has a, a different amount that its weight contributes to the overall score. So a, a climate indicator, we actually have four built in that we'll be building into the tool by April. Um, established are things that were in the February beta test, potential are indicators that we're gonna have ready for the, the April beta test. So things that are, are gonna be public in April, but you might not have seen if you're looking in February. So you can see each climate, um, variable has sort of collectively a contribution of 3.1% of, of the overall score. So 3.1 out of 100. Um, by contrast, we have, we have quite a few environmental effects and it's sort of lower weighted and um, it comes out as just 1.8% in the overall score for each environmental effect. So it's just something to keep in mind that um, as we think about which indicators we included and whether we should add more, um, something I struggle with is I'm very much a more is more kind of person. And I was sort of constantly like, we should do this data set and this data set. And then I was realizing, oh, if we get too many, then at some point, you know, ozone exposure is only going to be like 0.05% of the overall score. And we may adjust some of the scoring mechanisms over time based on feedback we get in the beta test, obviously. But it's just keeping in mind that the more indicators we add, kind of the, the less overall any one indicator has um, an impact on the, the total ranking. Any questions about that before I, I go forward? I know this is sort of a complicated slide to start with, but I thought it was sort of important to set the stage before I dived into the specific data sets. Joel, this is Uni. Um, are you going to talk a little bit about how you determined the weighting? I'm, I'm really, really curious about that. Yeah, so I think it was um, the, the David, Dr. Rojas, who's kind of the, the main developer of the tool, developed developed the rating system and then sort of had conversations with, with Kelsey's co-workers and our toxicology and environmental epidemiologist, um, Christy Richardson, our, our state toxicologist, and Margaret Horden, who's also on that team, and kind of came up with what seemed to make the most sense. Um, kind of from that perspective, David's also an environmental epidemiologist by training. Um, so I think it was really based on a sense of trying to prioritize or, or give slightly higher weights to things that we know are um, sort of indicators of, of health risk, right? So those environmental exposures, and then you know, sort of on the sensitive population side, really thinking about who are the groups who are, who are most vulnerable to pollution, right? So we, um, I think that's kind of a lot of how it was developed, but um, I, I will say I'm maybe not the best question person to, to answer those questions, but if you have specific questions, we can absolutely kind of bring them back to David or, or connect you or, or other task force members directly. So are there other kind of points you were curious about there? No, I think I'll just draft a question and share it. Um, yeah. Thank you. And we're, we're very open to answering those and then also to feedback. So if 
any of the task force members or even members of the public look at this and say, oh gosh, I think climate's weighted too high or socioeconomic factors are weighted too high um, or sensitive populations are weighted too low, whatever it is, like, you know, let us know. And I think we're open to, to making adjustments. Um, might not see it in the beta, but, you know, before we sort of finalize the tool and it goes live in June. Um, actually, one thing that I think has been discussed and there's no final decision yet is maybe combining climate and environmental effects as sort of a single category, um, but that would sort of underweight some of the climate factors related to some of the environmental effects. So, yeah. Um, Beatriz, go ahead. Yeah, um, I have a question. Do we also act ask, um, add to social economic factors like um, where community live, like for example, um, mobile home parks, are we considering um, if people have health insurance, um, all these other components or what type of um, potential um, illnesses or disease are related to environmental pollution in communities and talking about like asthma or low birth rates or other type of indicators? Are those easy to are you going to jump into each of those? Okay, sorry, maybe I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. No, no worries. It, yeah, I will definitely get into actually every single thing you mentioned is something we've either built in or, or considered. So do you want, is it maybe if it's okay, I can kind of get there when I get to that part of the presentation. Okay. Sheila, did you have a question as well? Yes. So when I consider all of these indicators, they're all I don't want to use the word, I mean, they're all um, toxic, for lack of a better word. <laughs> um, and so, you know, whether the environmental exposure gets the 3.1 or the, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I kind of feel like they're all horrible. And so, I don't know. I mean, I just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm fine with how they're weighted, but you could make an argument to weight them a zillion other ways. And I think the argument would be legitimate, but I'm not an environmental epidemiologist, but that's just my takeaway. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really good point. And you know, it's, <laughs> I think that's why we are very open to feedback. I mean, David is an environmental epidemiologist and he, um, he does like sort of have a sense just as Christy does about like, where should ozone fit relative to like living near a solid waste landfill or something. Um, but uh, I think, you know, ultimately it's all estimates, right? And, and that's okay. Cause um, you know, the purpose of the tool is not to come up with like a, a diagnosis or tell someone you absolutely will experience health outcomes if you live in a certain zip code. The, the purpose is really to guide where we prioritize our, our resources as CDPHE. So identifying communities that are more vulnerable or have disproportionate impacts that should be eligible for grant funding to our, the advisory board's environmental justice grant program, identifying the areas that are subject to things like enhanced um, and additional emission reduction requirements under the Air Quality Control Commission rules for disproportionately impacted communities. So I think we won't get a perfect score, but it's um, hopefully if we get the right mix of indicators there and a pretty good rating, we'll have a good sense of where we should be prioritizing our time as sort of the overall goal. But you're right, there's no, there's no perfect formula, which is part of why we are very open to feedback. So yeah, uni. Yeah, I feel like what Sheila was getting at was the asset framing. I think that I think the 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 the, the thing that she brought up, and also the same thing that I mentioned that I, I have a hard time naming it is is I, I just feel like some of these community communities, even though they're identified as you know um, disproportionately impacted, they may have something in them that set them aside from a different community that may have kind of this different this different um, impact. And I'm not sure what to call it. I know you do talk about socioeconomic factors, but we're always looking at, I mean, I'm a toxicologist, so always I'm risk, I'm risk focused. And so I always look at the negative of things like the health impacts and things like this. But I feel like a lot of these tools and sport, these methods are really missing something that the community brings to the table. 
things that need to be enhanced or things that need to be recognized as a value that the community has that um, sometimes may offset some of um, some of these these indicators that we use. I'm not sure. I mean, this is this is somebody's thesis. So this is for Jason when he when he grows up, you know, <laughs> he, he can work on that. But I, I, it just it just feels like everything is just so heavy and and negative. But these, you know, I, you know, having not lived in an EJ community, I guess, but I just feel like sometimes there's some there's some things within these communities that give them strength and we need to identify those things. And I don't know how to articulate that. Um, um. I, I don't know either, but task force members, please feel free to jump in. I, I don't have to respond after every question, but definitely taking good notes and it's worth thinking about. And we don't have a good answer uni, um, to that. I think it's a real challenge when, when making a, a mapping tool like this is how to identify community strength and resiliency. So we're, we're very open to ideas. Go ahead. Sheila. So, oh, it's, Sheila. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead, Sheila. Um, so my presentation, I'm going to talk about assets framing. I wasn't going to say anything, but uni, I, you just triggered me. Um, and so assets framing is a new, um, it's a, a way of, uh, a new model, you could say, um, a way of framing um, the strengths of uh, communities that are not part of the dominant culture. And I love that idea, you know, I mean, because they are certainly mitigating factors, and that would be something I would want to include in this score. I love framing it like that. I don't disagree, but I think it's up to the community to decide that. And I think that we might get some mixed results, right? If, if you have a, a strong, resilient community that has been facing environmental injustice for three decades, they might have some social bonds and networks that keep them strong, but that is that gonna like rest or, or, or take away from the urgency that we need to focus on certain communities because they have assets? Or when we're talking about assets, are we talking about solutions oriented right based on the ecosystem surrounding them are we getting into the role of proposing ideas for those communities based on those assets or those um maybe it's you know access to a certain area that can be a restoration project or something like that to build on those assets or is that really up to community to identify that and build upon that with the agencies. I guess that's my question that I just don't want to rest or take away from the impacts that certain communities are, are really living and it's impacting their daily lives and their ability to thrive and, um, you know, go beyond poverty and, and very detrimental health impacts that they are experiencing. So I think when we score things, not 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 to you know put this down or anything. I think it's important for um, example for um, prioritizing you know issues like that. But sometimes I feel like the 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 one problem or the one concern or the one indicator gets lost in the score somewhere. So from a public health perspective, when you look at these things, you look at it like let's say within an ecological frame. And you'll identify all the, the, the pluses and minuses and the neutral issues. And then when you develop your, your, um, your program that's geared to mitigating the problem, it's, it's focused on a specific issue. I guess that's, that's kind of where I'm going at. And when you have a score like this, you miss out, um, you may miss out a community that maybe has like really high environmental exposures but their socioeconomic factors are pretty good, you know, and they, they don't have a sensitive population. And so they kind of get left off the, the, the whole, the whole um, um, screen. And so they don't get what it is that, that they need in terms of dealing with environmental exposures. 
And so maybe this is, it, it, it's not quite environmental justice driven, but um, just looking at it a little bit broader than that. And the same can be said in reverse, you know, um, I just see that like the individual drivers for the score end up just kind of disappearing in the score. But from a public health perspective, um, um, those individual drivers are the things that we need to develop programs around. They're the things that we need to collect data on. They're the things that we can help a community um, and become more resilient, I guess that's what I'm looking for. Sheila, you had a thought on that? So I think I, I completely agree with Beatrice. Um, there, I, I mean, I see, and if I've heard, if I heard you correctly, there's this tension. Um, I believe that you certainly need to um, lift up all of these indicators that are on this slide. But I would also, I think it's important to identify assets and strengths um, because there's something that I, I believe is psychologically damaging when I think it's, I, I feel like it's, the, there's this deficits sort of paradigm here. Um, and there's, and it's psychologically damaging. Um, it doesn't honor the um, integrity, value, gifts of a community. And that's my concern if you are just looking at the indicators here. But I, on the other hand, it's very important to lift up all of this so that policies, programs, systems are changed. But I just think there needs to be some kind of a balance. Thank, thank you all. I mean, this is really valuable feedback and it, it's getting at, and I'll, I'll actually make sure we sort of share the recording of this section of the, the meeting with um, our contractors at CSU and the rest of the EnviroScreen team so everyone can really hear these ideas. And you know, it, it's, it's definitely one of the most challenging parts of, of EnviroScreen, right, is that it is sort of a, it is a, a deficits framed um, tool. And I don't know that we have all the answers. I think, well, we don't really have the answers. We, we have a few things we're doing um, in the tool, like we're going to actually build in some sort of qualitative storytelling aspects um, so that communities can tell some of their own story, but that doesn't sort of get to whether the score sort of includes sort of metrics of, of resiliency and community strength, and then also that even tougher question of does that obscure um, communities that need help if they are both a strong community um, or, or by need help, I mean, should, should benefit from the resources that will be allocated based on the scores in the map. Um, um, so I think it, it's, it, I don't want to pretend to have all the answers, but I think hearing this conversation is really helpful and um, can definitely inform us as we keep working through developing the tool. And then I, I would also just say, um, if you have more ideas on what we can do, please let us know as we continue to develop it. Um, you need to your point, I, I did want to just show this, this is a, the beta version of the tool and I'm screen sharing. So please note it's not final. I just came here and, and clicked um, a census block group in, in Lahana um, as an example, but you can see, actually I'm going to do this one in North Lahana. So um, this is an area, a community that's in the 99th percentile in the overall score, obviously not all the metrics are in yet. And we have these, these graphs, they're actually not going to always be down below. They'll be side by side in, in sort of future user interfaces that we're developing, but it does highlight, you know, even though it's in the overall 99th percentile for the score, um, it's actually fairly low in the environmental exposures and environmental effects categories in terms of its percentile as well as climate vulnerability, but very high in sensitive populations and demographics, right? So that's an example of where you can kind of click somewhere and, and see like, oh, like this, that, how it got that aggregate score. And then I'll come up here to Pueblo and kind of zoom in on an area close to the, the steel mill where I'm, I'm gonna guess we'll have sort of a different picture. So high score on sort of the environmental exposures and effects category actually, as well as the sensitive population demographic. So I, I, I hope that that functionality addresses some of what you raised, Uni, but if you have other ideas on how we can do it better to kind of understand what goes into this aggregate score, we're, we're definitely open to it. Um, and then I, I did see a question from, from Kelsey in the chat, which I will get to in just a moment. Um, and then I do want to kind of keep going with the presentation um, because uh, 
that they want to keep us on schedule, as, as you mentioned. So the, the rest of the presentation is really just talking through the indicators that we are have built into the tool, are going to build into the tool, and then are, are not going to build into the tool um, and, and why. So starting with the environmental exposures category, the things in green are things that are, are in the February, the, the beta version of the tool, and then the things in yellow are, are things that we will build in in April. Um, so you can see in, in the sort of environmental exposures category, we have um, multiple metrics of, of air pollution. That, that is often one of the main exposure pathways for environmental health risks. So we have ozone, um, particulate matter, so PM 2.5, um, traffic proximity and volume, um, diesel particulate matter, which is sort of overlaps with traffic proximity and volume, as well as particles, but sort of its own category, sort of given the, the content of what, what's in diesel particulates, um, as well as air toxic emissions, which is a, a data set that we actually developed um, just ourselves um, as CDPHG. So we, we took our, um, our air pollution emission notification data, which is essentially reported from all the different air pollution sources across the state, and we're able to come up with sort of a metric of the, the air toxics that have the greatest um, environmental health risks associated with them based on, on input from our toxicology and environmental epidemiology office. So it's actually a pretty exciting indicator because that's that's not something that I think most other states have been able to, to do or that's available in EPA, but it's obviously an important sort of health um, metric. Um, we, we have three other environmental exposures that will be built into the tool in April, which are our drinking water quality, that, that's another data set that we've sort of created from scratch using our own data at, at CDPHE based on where there are violations of our um, uh, drinking water rules, so which, which drinking water systems have, have violated our health-based standards within the past decade. Um, noise, which is a sort of important environmental exposure when we think about health that can lead to sort of stress and anxiety and other health risks. So we have a, a sort of noise map that I think is mostly focused on transportation sources of noise that we're integrating. And then we will build in data on, on other types of air pollutants, um, including um, sulf um, sulfur oxide, so SOx, um, NOx, so nitrous oxide and nitrogen dioxide, and, and then um, particulate matter um, that, that's coarser or larger, uh, known as PM10. So those, that's what's going to be in the environmental exposures um, version when, when we launch. Um, in terms of the environmental effects, most of what we've built in so far are kind of um, solid and hazardous waste related indicators. So national priority list sites are, are Superfund sites um, or, or things that kind of fall under CERCLA, the, the federal um, environmental cleanup law. Risk management plan sites are, are sites that have to submit a risk management plan under section 112 of the Clean Air Act. So those are sites that can kind of explode or sort of create major safety risks for, for folks who live nearby or, or workers. Um, things like fertilizer plants, for example. Um, proximity to hazardous waste facilities, and then wastewater discharge, so where wastewater is getting discharged into the environment. And then we're, we're also building in a surface water quality data set, which, which is another one that we built from scratch, sort of based on the classifications of which um, streams, rivers, and lakes in Colorado are impaired for different types of uses. Um, and then we're, we're using data from the Oil and Gas Commission and the Division of Reclamation, Mining, and Safety to identify where oil and gas facilities and mining located in mines are, are located and those will also be in the environmental effects category. Um, so in the climate category, so far we just have two indicators built in, which are wildfire risk and floodplains. Um, of course, climate change can increase the severity and magnitude of natural disasters like floods and wildfires. Um, we will also be building in metrics of drought and extreme heat days, which are another sort of metric of, of climate related risks or um, risks that can be exacerbated by climate change. For sensitive populations, and um, we have sort of <laughs> basically everything that the Bay 3 has uh, mentioned earlier, um, though, though not quite all of it. So these are so groups of people who may be more, more at risk from environmental health risks um, due to sort of pre-existing health risks or um, aspects of their identity that are associated with greater health risks. So, um, asthma rates, heart disease weights, um, low birth and low birth weight are kind of three things that are, are correlated with environmental health risks. And then um, very young people, older people, and um, life expectancy are kind of the other metrics that are built in there. Um, we, are, we are working on building in a, a metric of either cancer incidence or prevalence. Um, we sort of have two different types of data sets that we are trying to decide between in the next couple of days, um, um, one of which is an incidence rate and the other is a prevalence rate. Um, diabetes related hospitalization, which is sort of our best um, geographically 
focused data set we have for, for diabetes rates um, and then a mental health indicator as well. And actually, I, I'm not super familiar with that one, but those are kind of all the, the sensitive population metrics that we are going to be building in. Um, for, for socioeconomic factors, we have, um, we have race, income, education attainment, um, language spoken at home or linguistic isolation is, is the terminology used by the Census Bureau, and percent of people living with a disability, um, and then we're also building in housing cost burden as well. So that's what we have in the tool. Um, each of those indicators kind of come with sort of strengths and limitations, right, um, which I'm, I'm happy to go into if anyone has sort of questions about that, but I won't dive deeper into any of those sort of strengths and limitations of, of individual data sets for now. But I did want to just tell you sort of what we thought about including and, and aren't going to include, at least in, in, in Viroscreen 1.0, which is what's launching in, in June. Um, so the, the things in the, the left category are, are data sets we've identified as, as existing. Um, but we, for various reasons, didn't have sort of the time or, or resources to build into version 1.0, or we felt that um, a, a lot of the data sets we prioritized were things that we got public feedback on when we did sort of a first round of public engagement during the fall and, and were things that people identified as being important to them when we did that community engagement. And many of the things in this category are things where maybe we didn't really get as much feedback from the public that, that these were important to them. So that's kind of how we deprioritize them. Um, so in the environmental exposures, um, it would be, we have sort of a equivalent metric to what we did in, in drinking water quality, which is sort of a metric of air quality permit violations and where they happened. That one's really a resource constraint. It would sort of be quite a significant data lift to get our existing database to create that. Um, nighttime light exposure, so like, like noise, sort of night exposure to light during the nighttime can, can be disruptive to our health. Um, the location of uranium mines and mills, and then sort of PFAS risk and, and PFAS exposure. That is actually a data set that CDPHE is working on developing, but it, it, I think it isn't quite ready for, for integration into EnviroScreen 1.0, but could certainly be integrated into a future version instead. Um, there were also a few topics that we, we heard about in the engagement of that seemed interesting or, or um, data sets that our own team identified that we, or uh, sorry, indicators that our own team identified where we just didn't know where to get a good source of data that we could represent spatially, which include indoor air quality, radon and solar radiation. So those are all important exposures for our, our health in Colorado, but there's not really a, a good data set at least that we're aware of to, to use for them. Um, for environmental effects, uh, a lot of, we have sort of a, a large number of data sets that are generally waste disposal related. Um, for the most part, we have this data, but sort of cleaning it up in our internal databases when we did the math was gonna be about one full-time person working for a year. So um, not things that we'll be able to kind of build in, in into um, the first version of the tool, but one that we do hope to build in, in later. So that includes proximity to solid waste facilities and sort of other types of remediation sites. Um, impervious surface is an indicator we've, we've thought about that's sort of relevant to both climate vulnerabilities in terms of flood and then environmental effect and ultimately just decided we we can sort of deprioritize it for for at least 1.0 um, underground injection control wells is is something that we do have data on where, where they are located but um, didn't really hear a lot of members of the public being really interested in that during the public engagement and deprioritized it and same for underground storage tanks. Um, that was something where we, we can get the data on it. And, and actually EPA just built that into the EnviroScreen 2.0, but we, we sort of did a lot of polling and surveys during our first round of community engagement. And it consistently came in, uh, I believe last place when we asked people what they were interested in. So decided to deprioritize it for EnviroScreen 1.0. Um, and then finally, um, we, we heard a lot actually from the public about pesticides and exposures for farm workers. Um, and unfortunately, we just have not been able to figure out a good data set to use there. Um, there there's not, there, there's some county level data on pesticide purchases, but it, there wasn't really sort of the granular type of information we would need to, to build it into EnviroScreen at least yet. So it, it's definitely a data gap that I think would be one we'd like to explore in the future. Um, in terms of climate indicators, um, we got a lot of really helpful feedback from the Metro Denver Partnership for Health, which is a group of the local public health agencies in the Denver metro area on, on some additional climate indicators we could consider. Um, ultimately, we didn't build a lot of them in just because some of them were kind of either more, more work to sort of get the existing data sets ready or not areas that we heard as much about from the public. And obviously, we have quite a few data sets we're building in, but hopefully we could sort of 
explore that insect borne disease metric in the future, extreme cold days and projected precipitation, um, which I think overlaps a little bit with drought, which is part of why it's, we, we sort of focused on drought um, for now and extreme heat days because there's sort of greater health risks associated with those in the literature, according to David, than, than extreme cold days. Um, we also heard a lot about sort of adaptive capacity and, and the community's ability to adapt, which I think intersects in some ways with sort of the strengths-based metrics that, that we heard about from the task force members a few moments ago, um, but we didn't really know a good data set or way to measure that for the tool. And then groundwater vulnerability is something that California has built into California EnviroScreen, but we didn't really have um, an obvious equivalent source of, of data to build into our, our tool in, in Colorado. Um, for sensitive populations, there, there are actually a lot of sort of public health related data sets that we have at, at CDPHE as a combined environmental and public health agency. Um, these are actually metrics that we have sort of geographic data for um, and, and have used in sort of previous CDPHE um, mapping tools that are more focused on, on health equity. Um, and we ultimately didn't build these in because they are sort of less associated with diseases that have environmental causes compared to the things like asthma and, and cancer. Um, that, that we have built into the first tool, but they are all sort of important metrics of, of folks who are kind of our sensitive populations that are at least on our, our radar. Um, but sort of based on David's and, and Christie's sort of expertise and knowledge, we chose to sort of deprioritize them since they're not as, as linked to environmental causes. Um, finally, there, there are lots of socioeconomic factors that we have great data about and that I think Sheila will be speaking about many of these in, in just a moment um, that we, we didn't build in just mostly due to sort of time and resources of what it takes to kind of get each indicator ready to go. But we have we have good data for many of them. Um, a lot of the area things in the data sources that are unclear, I believe all of those are, are things that CDC, the, the Center for Dis Disease Control and the Prevention at the federal level builds into its, um, I think it's called a vulnerability metric. I'm, I'm actually forgetting the name of their tool. Um, which I think we could reach out to CDC if we, we wanted to, um, but we have, haven't yet taken that step, but we know that th those are things that have been considered in other kind of more health equity focused tools um, and things that we could potentially build into future versions. But um, just kind of given all the decisions we made so far, we, we haven't done that for Virus Q1.0. Um, so that is my whole presentation and it, it looks like Sheila has a question. So I'm happy to answer that and, and questions from any of the other task force members. I think you're referring to the social vulnerability index. Yes, thank, thank you. Okay. That is what I'm referring to. Um, any, any other questions or sort of further points of discussion from task force members? Yeah. I, I have a quick question, Joel. Um, so just so you all know, I, I did a tour um, with Joel and the new head of the EPA of Region 8 around Commerce City and, and all that area. Um, and something that really surprised me is all these little industries that add to the cumulative impacts. And um, it seems like we target the big bad actors, but then when you have a million of little ones, um, and I was thinking about like, heavy traffic in terms of industrial traffic as well there's a lot of concerns about just like semis idling next to homes and kind of those those routes of commercial zones that are in residential areas or invading residential spaces and then um like asphalt um companies concrete companies right it's like they're so cumulative and these small little sectors that are residential areas and if there's a way to have those permits that are out there for that type of industry yeah so that that's a great question and i i think it um the answer is i, I think we're doing a good job of, of capturing that with with the data that we are using so um i i mentioned we we actually have, to sort of talk about the truck traffic, that, that's part of why we really have like a strong weighting on multiple metrics of sort of traffic related emissions, right? So PM 2.5 traffic proximity and volume in diesel particulate matter, I'll bring that in and then indirectly noise from, from truck traffic would bring that in as well. So we've sort of talked a lot, a lot actually about like, are we overweighting or do we have too many indicators to kind of get at that 
um, traffic related and, and ultimately decided, no, it's, it's really important for people's um, health and, and lived experience to include. Um, and then, you know, I, that's actually part of your point about there's lots of small industrial sources. Um, that's sort of why I'm, I'm excited about our ability to use a lot of our own state level data sets because we do capture those in, in a way that sometimes federal data sets aren't, aren't able to get as granular in. So for example, the air toxic emissions, we have a, a pretty low um, reporting threshold for, for air toxics. It's a relatively small number of tons per year um, to, to report to the state, um, which you know could get sort of masked if, if it was in a, a federal data set. Um, and then um, you know, our drinking water quality data set, that, that includes any public water system. So it kind of gets at some of the smaller water providers that might kind of get masked in other situations. Um, similarly, anything that's subject to a, a risk management plan, um, I think can, can kind of get at that. So I think we've done kind of our best to use the, the available state level data to, to get at some of the smaller facilities that are, are really important to, to that overall cumulative health risk. I, I will say some of the many things in this sort of not included environmental effects category probably could get at that better. So for example, underground storage tanks is a great proxy for gas stations um, and um, which, which kind of are part of that overall cumulative fabric. Um, some of the solid waste facilities and, and other types of remediation sites is a good proxy for that. And then actually impervious surface is a good proxy for sort of large industrial sites. So maybe, maybe in, in 2.0, we can get even more granular, but that's kind of where we're at now. Yeah, uh, it looks like Uni has a question. Yeah, yeah, I have actually a couple, but you know, I'm just gonna focus it in interest of time. Um, is there is there gonna be a, a a mobile version of this tool that you can run on your cell phone just to kind yes. of get at people that don't have? Okay, that's that's good. Um, yeah. Um, how do you anticipate this tool being used? I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's 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 the, that's the golden question right there. How do you think you're gonna use this tool? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and and actually, the is it mobile friendly is, is sort of a part of that. So we we really want to design a tool that is usable and useful for usable by and useful for a really wide range of audiences. So. Ultimately, in our minds, the tool is not good if it's not sort of usable by and useful for the communities it's intended to, to benefit and direct resources to. So low-income communities and communities of color that are disproportionately impacted by pollution across Colorado. Um, so our, our goal is to really create sort of a very simple user interface that if like you're just diving into it for the first time on your phone, you'll still get something out of it and understand what's there. But also we know that there are a lot of other users like those of us in, in government and CDPHG who will use it for regulatory purposes, um, regulated industry will, will often use it. For example, the oil and gas sector is subject to specific requirements if for facilities located in disproportionately impacted communities under new rules adopted by the Air Quality Control Commission. Um, and then lots of academics are likely to use it. Um, hopefully legislators and policymakers will, will use it in kind of figuring out where to target resources. So. Um, I, I think because it sort of has multiple types of, of users, our goal is to really create something that <laughs> is usable at both levels. So it has like a simple user interface with an easy map, but then you can really dive deep in the data if you want to. So um, that's kind of, I'll go back to actually just screen sharing the tool. Um, so that certainly the user interface is not final and, and we're still working on it, but you know, we'll have kind of some just like basic text at the top. Um, I'm sharing the right screen, right? Can see it? Okay, good. Um, and then we'll have a kind of some basic explainers of what the data is, the actual map, but then the deeper you go down, you can kind of dive into all the graphs and metrics. And then we actually have pretty data, detailed data tables with like downloadable data that you can kind of get all the data out if you're a researcher. So that's kind of how we envision user groups. And we're trying to keep both the sort of everyday user and more detailed academic users in mind as we develop it. Okay, then finally, I think mine is just like a, a thought. Um, as you keep adding these different indicators into the tool, you, you start developing a tool, it becomes more and more complex. I think that's what I'm thinking about. And one of the things that you might wanna think about doing is doing a sensitivity analysis to, to to determine what's 
um, driving the, the, the score that you're seeing. And that can help in prioritizing um, in terms of, of which parameters or indicators are related, which ones are this kind of giving you the same kind of um, measurement. Like you talked about um, the PM 2.5 along with traffic, along with all these different things, they're kind of pointing you at the same tool. I mean, at the same, at the same area. And, and um, one of them is probably going to be driving it. Just similarly how we do hazard indexes um, you determine what's driving the, um, the health risk, and, and that's where you focus on um, um, mitigating. So it's just, just a thought, you know, um, for the folks that are working on the actual tool to think about conducting something, some kind of a sensitivity analysis. Yeah, it's, it's a great idea, and I will definitely bring that back to them. Thank you for suggesting. I, I'm, I'm sure they will be very enthusiastic to do that. So that, that's the type of thing I think David actually loves. So um, it, it's a great suggestion. And, and you know, the oh, I keep talking about resource constraints and like we had to make tough decisions. This is all just for EnviroScreen 1.0 that we're launching in June. We are going to keep updating, keep taking feedback on the tool, make sure it's iterative and, and improves over time. So even if we're not able to do that type of sensitivity analysis by June, hopefully we'll be able to do it in the future. So, um, Uni, are you, are you okay if, if Kelsey asks a question? Yeah, yeah, she's I'm not a to task force member. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Kelsey. Um, I think that um, Uni's suggestion of doing a sensitivity analysis is a great idea. Um, a lot of these metrics are probably pretty highly correlated with each other. and in terms of um, actually identifying what is most important and driving health disparity. Um, it's for, as in terms of like interventions and developing policy and knowing like which of these metrics are most important to target is definitely really important. Um, unrelated, well, sort of unrelated to that. Um, I, a lot of these um, different metrics, you have like unclear, like we want this data, but unclear where this data is coming from. Um, I, I put a random suggestion in the chat for indoor air quality, but um, I'm wondering if we do have thoughts on any of these, who is the best person to contact about um, ideas on where these different data sources may be coming, we could get. And also, do you have resources to purchase data? Um, yeah, well, the, the answer to the first question is, is for you is easy. It's, it's your boss, um, Christy Richardson, would, would be the best person to send the feedback to. So Christy and, and Margaret on, and Horton in the Toxicology and Environmental Epidemiology Office, who are also on Kelsey's team, um, kind of the lead data gurus for the, the, the task. Um, I'm kind of just there and more, more of a, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I'm, I'm not necessarily the right person to do all the, the data crunching. But um, so that that's kind of probably who you should reach out to. And um, I should also say, just because something says data source unclear, for some of them we did identify like possible data sources, but it was like, oh, we just can't get that at the right geospatial scales or et cetera. Um, and then, yeah, there, there's, a, there's, there's definitely a budget associated with the project. And I think even if um, something didn't fall within the project budget, we could use the environmental justice units budget if we operating budget if we need to, to sort of purchase additional data sources. Um, so. Yeah, that's, that's a good suggestion. Uh, uh, great. Hopefully, any more questions for Joel? Um, if there's any other questions, you know, um, um, feel free to put them in the chat and um, Joel and his team will access them and hopefully get some answers back to us. I have several more questions, which I will be sharing, but in interest of moving along, um, I, I, you know, I'll put that at a later date. So we could take a break now, or we could go ahead and 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 get Sheila, um, Dr. Davis, to go ahead and do her presentation. Um, personally, my opinion is I think we can we can keep plugging on. It's only been an hour, um, and I think that we've been engaged enough. Um, if you need to take a break, you know, just feel free to to take your break. But I think we just need to move ahead. So um, last meeting, um, one of the, the, the members on the task force had expressed interest in, in the other data sets besides the um, environmental data. And those are the data that's related to um, health, 
health equity and health inequities. Um, I know we spend a lot of time thinking about environmental impacts when we talk about um, environmental justice. And so this is the other part of it um, that Dr. Davis you know, works on. And so I'm really looking forward to see where her dreams of being a physician landed her. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Go ahead, Sheila. Thank you. Um, I sent my presentation. Did you want to control the slides or do you want me to just, if you want to, sh I can share my screen and do it. Hopefully it'll work here. Okay. Yeah, so I think if you share your screen and um, uh, that way you can progress your slides at your own pace, but if it, oh, it looks like you have it up. Yeah, okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you for inviting me. I am Sheila Davis. I am the director of the Office of Health Equity. And my presentation is intended to help us identify those areas of overlapping interest. In Joel's presentation, some of those areas have become apparent, but I hope that my presentation will generate more discussion around um, Indicators. Okay. So the goals um, for the next 30 minutes are to share the work of the Office of Health Equity that's mandated by Senate Bill 21181, to listen to your reactions and, our, and ideas around our approach, and then finally, to hear your wisdom on how to incorporate story alongside data. So um, in 2021, summer of 2021, um, uh, trailblazing legislation was passed. And that legislation is Senate Bill 21181. And it is all about dismantling structural barriers to health equity. And there are three provisions in this legislation. The first one is that it expands our existing grants program to provide opportunities um, for grassroots organizations to apply for funding for projects that create a foundation for policy and systems change. Um, this is significant because most funding opportunities are, are geared for um, nonprofits and other local public health agencies, organizations that have some degree of sophistication with respect to having a financial officer and maybe a grants um, writer. But we are trying to target grassroots organizations, people that are closest to the ground. The second provision is that we are uh, required to um, publish a series of reports on health inequities. And we are going to publish six reports. The first one will focus on people of color. The second, well, the first one is on people of color. The subse subsequent reports will be on people living with disabilities, people identifying as LGBTQ, people in remote communities, people who are aging and people on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. And the goals of, this, of these reports are for us to have a better understanding of the landscape of health inequities. Um, and this report is not like many health equities reports where they tend to use the deficits framing and they document the magnitude of the health inequity, and that's where they end. This report, the emphasis is on these upstream determinants of health. In other words, um, predictors of health outcomes that have nothing to do with what happens necessarily within the healthcare sector or within public health. So things like housing, um, ch early childhood education, um, so our report is looking upstream because we really want to identify root causes because if we can identify the root causes, then we can apply policy solutions and, and move the needle. So then the third provision has to do with um, what's required now of state agencies. So the state agencies that are participating um, in this work are now gonna to have to um, create 
equity plans to address these upstream determinants of health that are unique to their agencies. So for instance, you know, the Department of Transportation is now gonna have to figure out how um, to prioritize, I don't know, access to public transportation in communities of color or um, more green transportation. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the work of this office we do in partnership with the Health Equity Commission, which represents uh, communities across the state, represents the geographic, ethnic, racial diversity of Colorado, as well as 10 of the state agencies and their two legislators that sit on this commission. Okay. Before I start talking about the report and the data, I just wanna say that um, there have been health equity reports published before with varying degrees of comprehensiveness, respect and positive impact. And that our efforts are intended to dovetail with other initiatives such as environmental justice work, Health Bill 21-1266, which is why we're here. And the other thing I'd like to say is that the COVID-19 response is creating capacity for additional but necessar necessary initiatives. So these are the, the health agencies that are now represented under Health Equity Commission. Um, and they all um, have work or impact our health. Certainly the Department of Corrections, we know criminal justice has an impact on health outcomes for, for people of color. Department of Education, Higher Ed, Department of Human Services, HICPUF, Department of Labor and Employment, Department of Local Affairs, Department of, certainly, Department of Public Health and the Environment, Department of Public Safety, and the Department of Transportation. So I wanna dive into the structure of this report that we are putting together. Um, and I'm gonna talk about what's, with what's at stake. So as I mentioned that this report is a departure from previous reports because we are really looking at these upstream determinants, but it is also a departure because we are using an assets frame. So we are acknowledging the strengths, resilience and progress in communities. So for instance, um, our two federally recognized tribes <clears throat> have had the highest vaccination rates. Um, and so instead of just, um, documenting, publishing reports on, you know, the high incidence of various diseases, we want to talk about this because that is monumental. Um, and so often these assets and strengths get lost in the shuffle. They are never acknowledged, celebrated. And so we have these deficits narratives and these deficits narratives feed into this, um, this myth of sort of, you know, personal responsibility. Oh, if only you'd stop smoking. Oh, if only you would eat healthier when it doesn't acknowledge that maybe there are no, you know, grocery stores in your community and you just have to rely on the liquor store um, for, for food or that, you know, Philip Morris targeted your neighborhood. And so, you know, you started smoking when you were 10. Um, okay, so that's gonna be part of the report. We are looking at um, the fact that public health has made these investments downstream. So we've made investments in increasing access to healthcare, um, reducing risky behaviors like smoking, et cetera, um, prevention campaigns and screening. And while all of that is important, we still have these persistent patterns of disparities across life course and many health outcomes. This is after over 15 years of work in this area, because the Office of Health Equity has existed for 15 years. And um, so it's important for us to acknowledge some of the historic missteps of public health in addressing inequities, such as um, public health has been designed in large part uh, to serve the dominant culture. And in doing so, it prioritizes values, Western ways of knowing over indigenous ways of knowing. And so what would public health look like if we prioritized um, our DI communities? 
is part of what we are gonna discuss in this report. So this is a misstep of public health. We focused very much on the downstream, not the upstream. We focus on deficits instead of strengths. And the reporting has been more quantitative. Um, and, um, you know, and that's a very Western dominant culture approach. And so this report wants to balance the, down, the, the quantitative with the qualitative. In addition, um, public health has been guilty of misclassifying people um, in proper aggregation. You know, for instance, you know, Asian American Pacific Islander includes people who might be from Vietnam as well as Japan, as well as Tonga. And all of these groups have different histories in the United States and different health outcomes, yet they are all grouped together. And then there are issues of suppression. So um, the five questions that are framing this report include the following, and this gets at what we've discussed earlier. What is the optimal balance of investments in terms of dollars, time, and policies in the multiple determinants of health or indicators of health over the life course that will maximize, maximize overall health outcomes and minimize health inequities at the population level? That is one huge question that we attempt to address in this report, as well as in the Office of Health Equity. The second question that follows is, what are the unique roles that state agencies, local um, agencies can play, policymakers, grassroots organizations, activists? Um, what unique roles can we each play to reduce these health inequities? Um, Third question, which was raised, what are the critical upstream determinants or indicators that produce disparate health outcomes? Um, four or five, four, what are some of the promising policy system solutions that exist to, posit to positively impact these upstream determinants or indicators? Um, and then five, what happens when our, dis you know, our DI communities are centered in the work of public health? So those are the big questions that we attempt, we, we attempt to examine. So then we also, we're gonna discuss the landscape of, of these upstream determinants of health in Colorado. We're gonna talk about intersectionality because we all live at the intersection of multiple identities. We're gonna tie health outcomes back to these upstream determinants. And then finally, there's a call to action with promising policies and programs recommendations and next steps. I wanted to just present this framework um, because I think it's helpful in the work that we're doing in environmental justice. So, um, you know, when we talk about indicators or determinants, um, there's actual, there's a se sequential ordering to them. And that's one model and that model is called the Bar High Model, the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative Model, or Bar High. And so, according to this model, we have to start with root causes: class, race, immigration status, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity. Those systems of oppression, which lead to institutional inequities, which influence living conditions, risk behaviors, disease, injury, mortality. So there's so there's a ranking. And that's how we are conceiving of this work. So with respect to the data, um, we looked at the top, the leading causes of death in 2020 in Colorado, and we were looking for evidence of health disparities, and we saw disparities in eight of the 10 indicators in areas of chronic disease, cancers, cardiovascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, diabetes, liver, liver disease, cirrhosis, injury, motor vehicle accidents, accidents, drug overdose, suicide, as well as communicable disease, that is COVID-19. We're also looking at maternal child health, although I wouldn't say, I mean, maternal mortality, infant mortality are not among the leading causes of death in Colorado. Still very important to look at because it's an indicator of our health status. So I want to respect time. Um, 
I'm going to go through these slides quickly because we don't have much time. But what I'd like you to appreciate is that between 2019 and 2020, life expectancy diminished, declined for all races and ethnicities, but it was most pronounced for all communities of color, as you can see by the slopes of the lines. This is in the course of one year. Um, we also see evidence of um, higher mortality rates for African-American, um, American Indian and Alaska Native women in the area of breast cancer. We see higher incident, um, higher mortality rates in cardiovascular disease for African-Americans, um, American Indian Alaska Natives compared to the Colorado average. We are seeing similar patterns with diabetes, um, African-Americans, Latinx community, American Indians and Alaska Natives, we see these higher rates compared to the Colorado average. We see similar pattern with chronic liver disease, um, higher rates, American Indian, Alaska Native, um, Latinx community. We see higher rates in suicide mortality for American Indians, Alaska Natives. Um, we see increased maternal mortality in the American Indian, Alaska Native community. We also see this in the African American community. Um, that data is going to be published shortly. And then finally, COVID-19 mortality. We're seeing these um, higher rates of COVID deaths for all communities of color. So this is the part that I, I, I really want um, to emphasize because we're going to certainly, you know, publish this data but we also wanna look at these upstream determinants. For instance, physical environment. We're looking at residential segregation, food access, alcohol access, park access, traffic proximity, transportation access to safe places to walk, air contamination, lead risk. Um, in the area of the economic and work environments, we're looking at medium household income, poverty, child poverty, um, percent of households receiving SNAP food stamps on unemployment, home ownership, housing cost burden, nutrition security, housing security, homelessness, going healthcare due to cost. Um, we're looking at the service environment as well. I don't want to read all of them. I hope you'll have this uh, presentation. Um, and then finally, we're looking at the social environment, linguistic isolation, single adult-headed household, civic engagement, adverse childhood experiences, disconnected youth, incarceration, violent crime victimization. So I wanna open it up for discussion because I really wanna know what your feelings, questions, reactions are to this data. Um, and then also what missteps previous health equity reports have made in representing health strengths and needs in your communities. And then the final question is how, so, you know, we are presenting this quantitative data, but we are also going to present the stories. And so would love your thoughts on how to present them together in a way that's complementary. Thank you, Sheila. I think, oh my gosh, it's a lot to take in. You know, um, you know, we, we talk about health inequities all the time, but um, seeing it presented like this, I think is, is, I think it's very, very, very important. You know, that um, I like the way you use the word story, that, that people know this story and people understand this story, you know. Um, I would, I would also say the same thing to you that I said to Joel. I, I'd be curious as to, you know, some of the drivers or, you know, what are the, what's driving a lot of this, you know? So that would take, you know, doing it like some kind of sensitivity analysis of some sort. 
So if you were to prioritize some, some programs, you know, where would you focus in to make, make a change or make a difference? You know, you know what I mean? So, yes. So that's, that's the question um, that those of us in public health have been wrestling with for decades. I mean, the data suggests that, you know, adverse childhood experiences, housing inequality um, are some principal drivers. But, you know, there, I wouldn't say definitively that, um, but then, you know, when, I, when, I, when you talk about a sensitivity analysis, and that's the beauty of the bar high model is that, you know, we start with the systems of oppression you know, racism, homophobia, um, misogyny, et cetera, um, which translate into the policies that lead to, that led to redlining and, you know, um, policing versus public health um, in the area of substance use or, you know, wage and wage inequalities um, or, um, um, you know, the tax code and how it favors the 0.1%. So, um, you know, I, so I don't know how the sensitivity analysis, how that handles or, or how that, um, I mean, how these policies, these bias policies, um, whether a sensitivity analysis could say, okay, well, it was, it was redlining or it's the tax code, or it's, I mean, because they all seem equally devastating, but I, I'm open to hearing what others have to say about this. I mean, it definitely opens up some food for thought, you know, um, most definitely. Yeah, thank you. Um, Shayla, for, for sharing this. This is exciting. I'm, I'm really happy that so many additional elements of, you know, what are the health incomes, even civic engagement, right, are, are part of this, right, who's voting, who's not voting. Um, I, I find this really interesting. So, for example, we just got the, um, the report out, right, that the census probably missed, counted the Latino community by like 5%, right? So if like, we're counting on these systems and they're not quite getting all the right information. It's like, how, how do we get a better system that can really start to, to quantify, right? And I say this because I lived and documented in this country for, for many, many years. And, and I know I never visited a doctor. I have no preventive health care whatsoever. And unless it's like an emergency visit, right, where, where there's so many gaps that and there's so many voids in the data that we're collecting that how are we you know really being able to inform all all of these amazing you know points that you want to get to when we know um so many parts of our community on the, are on the fringe of society and and it's really hard to access their their information um and i'm thinking about preventative health care um, cultural competency in healthcare and trust in, in your government and your health institutions in mental health, right? And um, so many people are falling through the cracks. Anyway, I'm just, I think I'm just thinking out loud and, and thinking through like my undocumented experience living in, in, in this country and being a part of the, the fabric of our community and some of those determinants of health that I know I and, and a lot of my community and my family members have experienced. So that is why we want to pair story with quantitative data because the story can describe a whole stream of these upstream determinants, as I say in, you know, on the slide with a single sentence. Because our quantitative methods are, are limited. They are, they, and as I said, they are a product of Western ways of knowing and Western priorities. And so this is why we want to capture the story with the data. 
So, I mean, so this is this is a this is a report you're going to put out. Um, is it going to be because I think it'll be a lot of information and it may be heavy dense for you know somebody just to read it. But is there like a public portal or a query tool or something that people can access this kind of information if they wanted to? I mean, it might be something that we could, you know, recommend or argument or, you know, give some recommendations of, of, of you know, to develop some kind of focus on this kind of data. Because there's a lot of stuff on the environmental side, that's for sure. But this this piece of it is, is sometimes lost in the overall shuffle. So what do you what do you recommend? Um, I, I do know the CDPHE has some tools. You can go in there and look at various um, you can look at various data, I think by by county level. Uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember. I haven't looked at it in a while. I was doing some kind of back of the envelope um, data analysis. But something almost very similar to, you know, the efforts that's going into the EJ screen tool. I mean, the communities need this data. This, these are some of the things that they need. They need people to understand, look, you know, um, I don't know how granular it is, but um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're over there at a public meeting and somebody wants to bring a facility or facilities to your community and you have access to this data, that, are, that already depict that you know you you have these inequities already existing. It has to be a part of the conversation. And so, what I'm thinking is, maybe there needs to be um, uh, I would say maybe um, a public health component to the EJ screening tool so that you could get that additional data. So maybe that's um, EnviroScreen 2.0 or 3.0 is what I'm thinking. But yeah, I, I like want to, yeah, go ahead. Complementing each other. Right. And making it very easy to connect the dots and find the information or go to the um, climate equity to the health equity to the environmental justice where it's it's all talking to each other i love that idea i think i think you know the screen the screen was designed for a specific purpose i think you know um and 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 i i feel like this needs to be completely separate because again it will get lost um when you it could work, but there's just so many layers, and I think a lot of information would be lost. Um, I think the health inequities is tells a really big story that needs to be shared, aside from you know the environmental story. I but don't know. I, but they're but they're connected. Okay. Because because neighborhood has so much to do with health outcomes. And how do you define your neighborhood? Certainly it's the physical environment, but it's also the, the social network. And, um, and so, yes, I mean, I kind of feel that they're inextricably linked. And so, um, so what I'm thinking of is just a more sophisticated enviro screen with these other layers. Um, would be the best way to do that. If it's all right, uh, you need uh, Chair Blake if, just to weigh in. And I think it's, it's really exciting to hear these ideas. And obviously you as the, the data subcommittee of the task force can make these recommendations if you think it's valuable. And, and this is the type of recommendation we, we want you all to make. To, to think about like what would be useful for closing data gaps related to health disparities and, and getting data to communities. So I think um, if you if you saw Lumna and I smiling in the past few minutes, I think it's because it's great to start to hear you coalesce around these types of potential recommendations as a, a subcommittee. So, um, and of course, yes, and anything you all think we should do to build 
public health and virus screen we can certainly work on and it would give us maybe more more resources staff or, or money whatever we need if that's sort of a, a thing that's supported to a recommendation from the task force right um so just great to hear that discussion from my perspective as the the program manager Yeah, I think that's, I think I've, I've talked to Lamna about this, the advantage that Colorado has is that everybody's housed in that CDPAT umbrella and it's not like separate little departments all over the place. Yeah, I think, I think we definitely need to, you know, bullet this as something that we need to consider having further discussion on how we see this either um, wrapping into um, EnviroScreen or, um, I just I I feel like it needs it needs it needs to be front and center because um, this is the inf information that's getting lost when everybody's out there talking about other things, you know. Um, even though it, it's related, this this is almost like not necessarily an outcome or a result of you know what I mean. So it's not it's 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 a part of what goes into virus screen. But it's also a part that goes into so many different other um, other other entities. You know, you, you know, when you talk about redlining and things like that, they're not really captured in Enviro Screen, not quite. You know, so that's what I'm just saying. I feel like I feel like um, it's like we're almost at the beginning of the story, and this is this is a part of the story, and then there's a piece that Enviro Screen fills in, but then there are other pieces that end up resulting in some of the things that we're seeing with the work that you're doing. So it's just kind of identifying all these different aspects that end up feeding into um, the health, health equities and equities that, that, you know, that we're seeing. This is, this is, a, this is a very heavy, heavy, heavy topic. It's something that's going to weigh on I think a lot of people that called in, a lot of people that are involved in this discussion are going to really, really think about it and um, think about how they they talk about environmental justice or just even the social justice or whatever justice piece it is. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shayla. I appreciate that. Any 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 other comments or questions that you know we may have for her? I think after that, I, I am recommending we take a few minute break just to kind of regroup and 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 put our game face back on, and um, and um, and and um, come back and listen to um, um, Mandy Reese's presentation. So I think we need to take a let me check the time here. Maybe a just a quick five minute break. Um, it's thirty seven. Um, was it 437 for y'all? Is that what it is? Yeah, that's okay. right, Nini. Um, and I know, Mandy, we um, we promised you 35 minutes for your presentation, and I, I don't want to skimp on that. I feel like the conversations that we've been having are extremely substantive, and um, I, I do want to keep the conversation going. So um, if folks on here, and, and maybe I could just at least get some head nods or, or head nose, um, from especially task force members, are you okay with extending our meeting to 515? I have to jump off, unfortunately. Okay. Um, all right, well, uh, Uni, are you able to stay on till 515 as well? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, and this meeting is being recorded and we're taking extensive notes. So Sheila, maybe um, you can get plugged back into the conversation that way. Um, based on what uni said maybe we could just take a quick four or five minute break and then be back at um 4 42 um and uh, mandy and then we'll we'll give you the floor thank you
we, I think we have folks back. Um, and Mandy, thank you so much for your flexibility um, and your willingness to stay past um, five o'clock. Um, okay, Uni, I will turn it back over to you. All right, thank you. Um, welcome, Mandy. Uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Um, feel free, you have slides to share or, okay, well, go ahead. All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Mandy Reese and I have a master's degree in applied geography and geospatial science from CU Denver. And I'm currently in a PhD program there in uh, geography planning and design. And I'm really looking at um, spatial inequities. Specifically, it's related to environmental justice and transportation infrastructure and sort of the history of transportation policy. Um, but I'm here because I'm working on a project um, as a consultant with um, Protegete uh, Conservation Colorado, looking at, um, I'm gonna talk a about this in, in a minute, um, but looking at um, the disproportionate um, impacts of environmental health on Latinos across the state. So through the work in this project, um, it has become apparent as we all, you all have mentioned, uh, huge data gaps and issues with data that are really um, impacting our ability to do work and show sort of the truth about what's really going on um, to some communities. I wanted to start with a map we probably all know, um, a map that is easily easy to access. You know, anybody can go online and look at this air quality map and they could gain a little bit of information um, about the you know, quality of their environment. But this map also highlights some of the key issues that we have um, located while we're um, attempting to collect data to sort of answer some big questions. Um, number one, we have limited a air quality monitors. You know, looking at this map, it doesn't mean that other parts of the state aren't suffering from poor air quality. It means we're not capturing it. And if, if we're not capturing it, we're not doing anything about it. We're not researching it. We're not understanding why, you know, certain things might exist. We're not looking into that work. Um, the, these monitors are inconsistent. You know, they, they don't all capture the same amount of pollutants. They don't all, I mean, the same types of pollutants. And so you might not know uh, the impacts um, on, on specific individuals. Here's an example of the, the Swansea um, indicator uh, air quality monitor. You can see that this one has, is capturing four different pollutants. Um, some other ones capture one, some of them are turned off. So, you know, what is this saying about data, data capture and um, accessibility? And then in addition, you know, if you go to this website, you can look at some of the some of the reports, but you cannot download this data easily and put it on a GIS and run analysis and understand what it means and sort of what the larger implications are. And so this is a good example of some of the issues that we run into. So our project, just a brief introduction, is to look at the impacts of environmental health on Latinos across the state. Our goal isn't to make any sort of scientific correlations or causations, but we want to know where do Latinos live, what is the environmental health of that area, and is there something going on between those two things? What is the overlap? Um, so, you know, what's the proximity of, of Latinos in Colorado to pollution, to industry, to urbanization, to impacts from climate change, uh, environmental justice in general? What additional impacts do um, socioeconomic spatial locational indicators like where people live in proximity have on this population? And what can be done? You know, we need to find out what the problems are in order to do something about it in the future. So through this project, we have really located four data gap areas, areas where data is just not collected at all. Or if it is, it sure can't be found by anybody. <laughs> it's very hard to locate. Proprietary data, data that you have to pay for. Um, data accessibility, data that uh, is hard to access um, for, for somebody like me who is trained in this, which means what does it say for you know, the regular community person who wants to know, what they're, you know what's going on with the pollution in their drinking water. And then data accuracy. Anybody can publish any data they want right now. How do we know what can be trusted and how do we vet good data? So um, for our project, this is a whole list of data that we are not able to find. Now, uh, whether that means it, you know, it's somewhere in some pocket, um, 
data that allows us to look at sort of as, as was being mentioned earlier uh, by Joel, being able to look at race, ethnicity, and multi-scalar geogra geographic regions, such as neighborhood block, census tract, um, to really understand this, this fine, uh, fine scale um, impacts. It's not something that, uh, that is available. You have to choose. You have to choose. You either look at it at the geographic scale or you look at it at the race or eth ethnic ethnicity scale. What does that tell us you know, about what, what needs to be done? We don't know. There's no way we can do this without running statistical analysis that then requires predictions and hypotheses. And then that's, you know, that, that's not the, the best way if we could potentially you know, create it another way. Looking at things like urban infrastructure at a, a scale larger than municipalities. Like if we wanna know tree canopies, zoning, um, trying to find zoning for some of the smaller towns in Colorado, you can't, you know, it's impossible. There's no one place where you can go and download zoning for like, you know, every municipality that has a zoning plan or a zoning code. So that's really hard. You're unable to locate areas specifically dedicated to industry at a statewide level, for example. So an issue we're running into. Grocery stores, got to do it at a city level, <laughs> not something that exists, you know, statewide grocery stores, convenience stores, and then understanding who those populations are. Um, we have been unable for our report to locate um, information, GIS information, spatial information about who uses septic systems. There's plenty of data sets about where wells are located, but nothing about what the materials of the wells are or how old those wells are and maybe when they were tested last to see if they were safe. Um, we don't know about the, the age and materials of plumbing that's going into people's houses. Um, so some of these levels of information that are somewhere, they exist somewhere, they're just, they're not something that, that we were able to find. Um, utilities, this is something, again, um, important when we think about things like uh, climate change and access to utilities. Locating things like average usage um, by type or by whether or not people need assistance to pay their bills, these data aren't collected by race and ethnicity. And so we don't know necessarily who, um, who is needing assistance in these programs, what kind of assistance they're needing, whether or not their energy systems, their utilities are efficient. Um, we don't, you know, there's, there's not a way to know this right now. And then as far as outdoor recreations and public lands, you know, we're in Colorado, we've got a ton of information here, but again, we don't know how many Latinos apply for and receive and use fishing and hunting licenses because we don't ask. We don't know how many go camping, how many participate in outdoor activities in national parks, in state parks, because we don't ask. These are questions that are not, you know, are not captured because they're not being asked. Perhaps, maybe there's other reasons. Um, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, really detailed information about jobs and industry, but nothing about bilingual uh, um, employees in any outdoor uh, jobs at all, um, actually. So, you know, these are all gaps, just things that we couldn't find. But then there's other things, proprietary data that, that you know, you have to pay for. Or, um, as Joel was talking about before, are such complicated indices that unless somebody's willing to share that with you, there's no way you can create that on your own by yourself, you know, as me, one person, you know, trying to, to understand this. So there's certain things that we just cannot include, things that cost money, you know, or things that uh, aren't able to be recreated, such as um, since 2010, precipitation and temperature data, um, you know, they're, they're proprietary climate, climate data in general, so you have to pay for it, you have to have access to it, or you have to estimate it. Um, remote sensing and aerial imagery, you have to pay for it. So if you wanna know anything about you know, uh, vegetation, NDVI, tree canopy, you know, sort of at a large scale, that's something you have to have um, access to. Well, as a person who works with and creates these sorts of data sets, I understand intellectual property is, is something we should value, but so is knowledge for the public. And so we should figure out how do we remedy these two things? You know, how can we value the, the time and effort put into creating and gathering these data at the same time as making them accessible for the public? Um, data sets that exist, but you have to know about, like the environmental justice mapper, 
COHID, Dr. Cog, COMAP. If you do a Google search, these are not going to even show up on the first page of Google. And I'm a person who looks for these things all the time, and the algorithm still isn't sending them to my, uh, my search return. What is that saying for other people who might just want to look and go to COHID and, you know, it's not going to come. And, and now that COVID exists, it's really hard to find COHID because anytime you type in COVID public, COHID public health, you get COVID instead. Um, so, um, you know, these are just issues where there is data that people might not know exists. And then da data sets that are just challenging to work with, again, things that have to do with remote sensing, aerial imagery, um, air quality, where people either don't want to share it or, um, you know, it's just, it's hard to, to, to analyze. And then there is, of course, with all of these uh, institutions, Instances where you can, you as an individual can formally request data, but the number of times I have been told working on this project that they just don't have time to talk to me is, is, is a little bit um, um, upsetting. It's as if they don't value the work that, that we are doing here. So I have put in multiple data requests and multiple have been turned down just because they, we've been told they don't have the, the capacity to support our work. So that's an issue. <laughs> the data exists. Why is it so hard to access? Um, so um, last really issue here before I share a few things about the census. Um, you know, there are of course collection issues. Uh, I were, was working for Tri-County Health Department uh, during the pandemic and analyzing the data for them, we were missing a whole bunch of factors, like 95% of the data that we had was not, um, did not include race and ethnicity, although the questions existed in the screeners and in the surveys. And what we found out by talking to nurses was that they just didn't feel like they had the time and it didn't matter, that that was not important data for us to be capturing. So there's a lack of standardization and or potentially ethics in gathering these data. And if we aren't asking these questions, then we aren't going to know, you know, sort of these what these disproportionate impacts are. Um, there's a lot of data sets out there, but they don't have information about who made them. What are the definitions of, you know, what these indices are? How do we describe um, um, the, the background of, of why they exist? Like, for example, a lot of the survey of the data that we use is self-reported individuals telling you what they feel or what their answers are, which is great, right? Community level data. However, it also then has issues when it comes with, um, you know, sample size. So we'll, we'll dive into the census in a minute, but um, things like PRAMS, the Pregnancy Risk, uh, risk Assessment Monitoring System, um, or Healthy Kids, Healthy Moms, you know, all of these are surveys here that you, you, you opt into and you choose how you answer. So we need to think about that when we're using these data sets as our, as the, you know, sort of answers to our questions, because how were they collected and does it actually answer what, what we need to know? So we all probably know this because we're working on this, but in the United States, you can be one of five races. You can be white. You can be Black or African American, you can be American Indian or Alaska Native, you can be Asian or you can be Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. You don't get to choose if you're Latino or if you're Egyptian American or if you're Lebanese American, what are you, what are you supposed to choose? So we're expecting people to choose and associate themselves with a category that doesn't represent who they are and also doesn't give them the benefit of actually being a white person in society. So this is a, a huge issue, you know, with, with um, the census. However, it's the only data source that we have, right, w w in terms of population. And so what are we supposed to do? Um, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, just released a few days ago, um, they say that there was a, not a significant undercount in the total population, but certain groups of people were undercounted, children, older adults, working age men. And in terms of race and ethnicity, Black, African-American, or any combination of that, American Indian, Alaskan Native, or any combination, some other race, or any combination of Hispanic and Latino all have been undercounted. All races, uh, all categories of white people and Asians have been overcounted. So this is critical for us to think about as we understand 
why data need to be available, why it needs to be better collected, and you know what, what we can do in the future. So the key takeaways from the census, I think um, total numbers are great, are, are correct, but certain groups are over or undercounted. The other count undercounted groups are all non-white people of color. The overcounted groups are all white or Asian. So this has a lot of implications, you know, for the work that we do in policy. But specifically, I think what it can do is help us ask questions about um, work in the future, about standardizing data collection, about implementing codes of data ethics and making data accessible, but guaranteeing that privacy and you know, respect for intellectual property is respected. With all of this in mind, we, you know, have been running into issues of geographic scale. You know, this keeps coming up and how fine grained you can get with geographic scale. And we're finding data that exists at, you know, the HSR region in Colorado, but we keep coming across questions like, who updates these HSRs? How often are they updated? Are they updated with every, every decennial census? Um, if so, who updates them? How often do funding and staffing change in these HSRs in order to better represent the dynamic population? Because what we're looking at in our analysis with our maps that will come out is there are small populations of isolated Latino communities in the middle of these HSRs surrounded by white people. And um, you know, are they being represented and do they have the services they need? So um, that is my uh, soapbox about data <laughs> and data accessibility, but I would love to hear thoughts and questions and comments about, um, you know, any of the things that I said, and if perhaps you know of data sources that I missed, I would love to hear that as well. Chela Garcia is here. She's my teammate on this project. I'm sorry I didn't um, introduce you earlier, Chela. I was a little nervous, but um, she's really doing, we're, do, we're, we're collaborating together. She's doing a lot of the writing and the sort of um, academic research and I'm doing the data collection and the data analysis and we're combining forces to create this um, this sort of overall look at environmental health and Latinos in the state. So go ahead. I'm here, um, Chela or uh, Beatrice, if you want to add anything or any questions. Thank you very much, Mandy. Um, a lot of questions, a lot of um, things to think about from you know the data subcommittee. This this kind of actually follows really perfectly with the previous presentation about this idea that there's a lot of data out there that can be utilized. And I'm seeing two different groups of data. You know, the one that the researchers need. And then the one that the community needs, like, you know, to be able to understand where they live or even to make choices where they, they can live or where people do live. And so I'm just thinking about how um, you ultimately get that data to the people that need it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just off the top of my head, you know, I think about some kind of EJ Explorer website where people can go on there and look for all kinds of data that they want from a public perspective and then have like some kind of reference or separate um, access point for researchers to, to get like the raw data that's needed that ultimately yeah. ends up in an explorer. Because I think, you know, the public facing has to be um, well um, communicated so people can understand can, within the right context and things like that. But a researcher just needs the raw data. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, and that's what we notice is there are multiple audiences for the same data sets here. And we need to think about what that looks like. You know, how do we present data to researchers versus policymakers versus regular people whose lives and children's and grandparents are being impacted? It's the same data, but we have to show it and make it accessible in a variety of ways so that everybody can take from it what they need. And I mean, I just think we're in the middle of this. You know, we're flying this plane a, 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 as we're a, we're building it as we're flying it. But I think it's important to to you know think about these things before we build in uh, uh, I don't know processes that are hard to undo. I, I don't know. Perhaps that's already done with the census and the way it's collected, but I don't know. Okay, I see a hand up. Um, yes, hi. 
how, how do you pronounce your name? Yeah, my, my name is Chela Garcia. Um, yeah. and I'm working with Mandy Reese and Beatriz um, on this project. And um, whether or not you are approaching this as a researcher um, or someone in a community who's deciding to either rent or purchase a house in a specific neighborhood, right? Um, the data um, access points are very um, inaccessible, um, even in the current maps that are listed on COHID or through the CDPHE AQ website right there. You have to click on five different links to access one specific you know, question that you have. Um, should I rent in this community or not, right? Um, and that alone to me is just so mind blowing um, that, that any one person needs to, you know, um, one, you can't access it through Google easily, right? Uh, the fact that that's not a paid service that is being uh, facilitated for community members where it's one of the first two things that pops up is mind blowing. And, and I know Mandy ran through all of these points in her, in her presentation, but I think, um, Having been on both sides of, of both research and also just as a, as a community member, um, that is one of the key points, as well as the fact that um, when you are in the maps or when you are with the data, um, data can be skewed in so many different ways and it's not unbiased, right? So many people try to say that science and uh, facts are unbiased, but the way that it is presented even um, and who presents those, um, Mandy and I have run through, I want to say four or five different ways of presenting the data that we're look, that we do have access to. And whether it's looking at standard deviations, whether it's looking just at comparing the means, whether it's looking at the max and min ranges, right? The way that you are looking at data and presenting it to community, that's why community doesn't trust data, right? Even when it is presented, because it can be manipulated. And so even for community, when we say, oh, we need to tailor it um, or quote unquote, dumb it down for community to be able to read it, right? I don't think that's true. I think it needs to be explained so that community can read it and say, I can trust this data based on the descriptor, right? So it can be presented in a way that is, um, digestible, but also um, in a way that is true and in, and in a way that is transparent. And I think that is the, the key point that I've realized um, with all of the data that we've sifted through, uh, through these various state agencies is the transparency is not there. That is that transparency is lacking. And um, I hope that Mandy's presentation and um, Dr. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sifting through all of the Davis. names. Yes, I don't, did she jump off? Yes, um, yes. Dr. Davis, um, you know, this, we're not the only ones doing this. And I really hope that, um, and, and I'm excited for the recommendations that you all are giving because there needs to be a centralized place. There needs to be transparency um, from state agencies, from local, local governments. And of course that takes funding, right? That, that's, I'm not oblivious to that, but um, I hope that we can consolidate the data in, in a transparent way. Thank you for listening to my rant. I know it's not a rant. Um, I think there are other concerns um, that I've run across when sometimes you share this data and it may have some other implications. For example, um, if I was in a community that kind of falls into some of those uh, in, into a certain group and and I want to sell my house and yet my community has been labeled as such as a potential such and then I, I run into those issues um, we saw something similar in in a different state where um, we work where there was concerns with water wells and um, water wells being closed to certain operations or certain you know things and a lot of people felt they didn't want their water tested because they didn't want to be um, identified as somebody that had this specific issue. And so there's also that other part of it. So um, I think we're gonna have to have a lot of conversations around those sensitivities. I'm not an attorney, so I'm not sure um, how that plays into um, the data, um, what data that we can make public and what data can be made public. But I do know if you go look up, if you're looking for a house on Zillow, 
it'll give you all these statistics on crime, statistics on, on what the neighborhood looks like and all those different statistics, but that's in that database. I'm always curious as to, you know, where do they get that data from? So, um, as, you know, as we're thinking about this, Beatrice and, you know, Shayla, who's not on here, uh, we just have to think about what is the best way, besides the data gaps, what is the best way to present this data? Um, is it like a separate, how, how do we, do we, do we lump it all together under, um, you know, um, Enviro screen? Or is it going to like a clearinghouse of some sort so that when people are looking for certain things, they can find them? So we, we have, we have, we have some work ahead of us, essentially. Go ahead, Kelsey. To Kelsey, yeah. Um, sort of to piggyback off what Uni was saying about um, people's concerns about sharing like private data, like for example, private well data. Um, I, I have been working on this PFAS um, map where we're, we're trying to make all the PFAS data we have in this state more transparent because it is all publicly available, but as we've all just discussed, sometimes it's really hard to find the data, um, even if you know what you're looking for. So we're trying to make it so that it's all in one place. And some of the data sources that we have are private well data. Um, and so what that is one of the issues we've been run it, running into. How do we present this data and make this data available while also protecting these people's privacy? And so what we are currently planning to do is um, we, we jitter all the locations so that they're not in, over the actual person's house. And then we also make the dots very large when you zoom in on them and then the dots disappear once you get to a certain distance away. And then if somebody is to request the data, we'll just provide them the data at the county level so they can still see what levels we're observing in these wells at the county level, but it doesn't go closer than that to preserve people's privacy. So that allows people to still see the spatial pattern of the data when they're looking at the map and see the, the range of um, concentrations that we've observed in these wells without compromising people's individual like home value. Um, so that's what we've come up with. I, it's not perfect, but I think we're hoping that it'll um, address some of these issues. Um, being both transparent and protecting people's privacy. But that's definitely been a, a big challenge with this PFAS data project that we've been working on. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, because that's something we, we keep talking about, is we know that septic systems are private, but we also know that they, are, um, they have uh, health impacts, environmental impacts. And so, yeah, how do you weigh that? How do you weigh individual privacy versus overall public health, you know, or... or um, combining, comparing those two things. And also, you know, thinking about, especially if we're thinking about renting or home value, you know, nobody wants their house to be labeled at, you know, in a dangerous neighborhood. However, we can't solve the problem if we don't know that. And so, again, how do we, how do we remedy these? How do we deal with those two con conflicting sort of ideas that we need to know where they're located even if we don't want to know <laughs> where they're located. I'm kind of adding to this conversation a lot of, for example, you're touching on water. Um, we have a lot of community members that live on private property in a mobile home, right? So how do we, you, you want to protect the landowner, yet you have 300 families living in that community um, that they don't necessarily are the private landowner, and it's not associated with the value of the land. So I think kind of going back to um, our conversation and the equity analysis is like, this is a civil rights and it's so issue, right? And it's, it gets so messy because it's, it's systemic and it's rooted in many historic oppressions and, and racism like um, Dr. Shayla was mentioning, right? But um, that's like that double-edged sword, right? So if you don't know the information, also as a homeowner, how are you going to demand from your government to provide you clean water if you don't even know exactly what's coming into your, into your home and into your family? All right, Joel. Yeah, and I, <clears throat> Beatrice, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up mobile home parks and, and water quality because that, that's one of the most challenging problems we at CDPG have to work on in, in the environmental justice space and just generally in the water quality space. And 
Um, so a, a mobile home park that has at least 15 residences or there are at least 25 people being supplied with water does have to register as a public water system. So they, they don't count as, as private property anymore and, and we can make their data available, but there, there are plenty of smaller public mobile home parks, I think that probably fall under that threshold. But then I think that really gets back to the point that um, I think um, Mindy or, or Chela made earlier about um, how do we account for my small communities, so say a mobile home park that's maybe surrounded by a more affluent community or a mobile home park that has more Latino residents um, that's in a kind of overall wider area, right? Like it, it's easy to obscure that even when we're down at the census block group level, um, particularly because the census block groups are as granular as we can get in our data, but as we just heard, they undercount certain populations. And so, you know, I think that that's like especially true for mobile home parks. So it, I, I'm, I'm just seconding that problem statement really that it's a big challenge and that it would be great to see this the subcommittee think about ways that we can kind of address that that challenge um at least in, in the data as we kind of you know can then use that data hopefully to continue our, our work to do a better job of enforcing drinking water compliance issues in, in mobile home parks across the state so. i think that's so well said and it's very very good statement to kind of wrap up this conversation. And so um, on that note, I think this has been, has given us a lot of different things to think about. And um, um, I've been working on a way to try and set framing um, a lot of these conversations into a way, I'm, I'm, I'm a technical geek, so into a way that we can look at it and start really seeing where the gaps are and seeing where we need to go. And then um, hopefully once we, we figure that out, um, we'll make it a lot easier to talk about gaps and make recommendations on how we fill those gaps and then really start thinking about the cumulative piece. You know, how do we start talking about cumulative impact? Because I think that's, that's going to be our bread and butter for the next few months. And so I, I, with that, you know, I wanna, I think we've come to the end of our meeting. Um, is there anything Labna that you, you wanna, add at this point? Um, not much. I think, you know, you just touched on a really um, key point, though, you know, in talking about cumulative impacts. And as we've been having these separate subcommittee meetings so we can get into these substantive topics, there's also a point where there's going to be a lot of overlap between the different subcommittees. Um, and so kind of as task force members and, you know, I'm looking at you and uni and Beatriz, you know, coming back to the larger meeting and kind of thinking about how to make these recommendations cohesive again, you know, like have them be focusing on things that are specific, but also um, intersectional. And so I think that's something that um, we'll all have to think about. Um, so just wanted to, to plug that reminder. Um, but you know, thank you to everyone for, for staying um, 15 minutes past the, the hour. I think we were a little ambitious with our agenda today, but I, I really think the conversation today was amazing. And um, again, this meeting was recorded. Um, the, uh, there are extensive notes that were taken and the presentations are on our public drive. Um, and I'll actually just drop a link to that in the chat um, in just a moment here. Um, but thank you so much for, for all of your um, engagement and participation. Thank you. Gracias. Buenas noches. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a good, have a good um, evening. Bye. Good night. And anything you need to chat about or want to chat about? Well, oh, actually, let's stop the recording. Yeah.